usually I begin everywhere I possibly can by taking a concept and giving you a picture first and try to apply our intuition to see, okay, well, what do things look like and what might the answer be? Now, in this case, I'm actually going to do it in reverse. I'm going to do it the rigorous proving, you know, everything with the algebra way first, and then we'll get to the picture and you'll be like, ah, oh, of course, okay? So, if we want to do calculus, before we get to integration, first we need to know a derivative, okay? So here is the simple question I am going to pose. Here is the simple question I'm going to pose to you. Once we get sine x, um, cos is defined in terms of sine, and tan is, def is defined in terms of sine and cos. So once we get sine, really everything will just kind of fall out from there. Okay. So how we go about doing this? Hmm. Differentiation from the very beginning, right? <laughs> from the very beginning, we began with like defining the derivative in terms of the gradient function. Do you remember that? It's all about gradient, okay? So therefore, what did we have to do if we want a derivative of something? How do we bring gradient into play? What did we use? Yeah. Right at the beginning. First right at the beginning. We use first principles, right? We think gradient, mm -hmm. so rise over run. Yeah. So this thing here is a function. This is my f of x. So the definition of first principles is the limit as h approaches 0. Now, what's usually on the numerator? We're usually talking in terms of f's and f dash, right? So what's going to be on the normal numerator? F of x, f of x plus h. Take away f of x. That's your, that's your um, sorry, that's your rise, isn't it? That's your rise. But here, I've defined f of x as sine of x. So therefore, on my numerator, there's f of x plus h, and there, is f of x. Yeah, looking good? Now, you can see before I go any further, why I needed to do, like when we did trig expansions way back, this is part of the reason why. It's not just like, oh cool, I can do sine of, uh, you know, 30 plus 45 degrees. That's kind of just a sideshow. This is really where it was heading, okay? And of course we divide by the run. No big deal, okay? Now, since we know how to expand these compound angle sort of results, I'm just going to take sine of x plus h, and I'm just going to quote the identity. What identity will I get out of that? Sine, sine x, x cos h. h. Very good. Plus. plus. plus Great. We'll keep the angles in the same order, x's and, and the h's, and then I have this sine x over here on the right hand side. Okay. Now you look at this and you think, okay, that's a bit of a mess. Where can I go with this? Now what you ought to be thinking is, what have we learned already that will help us deal with this? Okay? And I want to point out to you, for instance, just as one little item, right? Have a look at this guy here. Oh, Do you see that? Do you see him? Should make you really, really suspicious, right? You're like, huh, if I could do something with that, then I can work with this thing. Okay, now that's the first clue. There are other clues lying in there. So what I need to do is notice that I have a whole series of terms that are connected to h, they're connected to the limit, and then I have other terms that are not connected to the h. They are independent of h. Which terms are those? Minus sine. This guy? Yeah. What else is independent? Minus sine. That guy over there. And one more. This guy in here. So what I need to do is disentangle them from what's happening with the limit to do with h, okay? So here's the way I'm going to do it. Um, I noticed right from the beginning there's these two side terms, so let's get them out of the way first, okay? Let's say I've got limit as h approaches 0, and if I take sine x out as a factor from those two terms, I'm going to get this guy. Sine x outside of this. Do you agree with that? Like that's me factoring out those two sine x terms, right? Now, I could tank on this next bit over here, but because I've got a sine x thing happening and a cos x thing happening, I'm actually going to deal with them as separate limits. The limit of a sum is the same of, as the sum of the limits, so I'm just going to separate this out from one limit into two. So here's one of my fractions, and here's my other one. Okay, I hope the wheels are turning here, right? I can do a couple of things here. The whole point of identifying in green the terms that are independent of h is to say, well, you know what? 
they're completely unaffected by those limits. As H approaches zero, they don't care. They have nothing to do with it. So I can remove them out from the limits in exactly the same way that when we're, don't write this down, when you're integrating something like this, right? That too, he doesn't care what's happening. Whereas X has, you know, derivative X integrating whatever. That's why you can pull him out the front. Well, in exactly the same way, sine X and cos X, they don't care what this limit is doing. So I'm going to extricate them out like this. It means take it out from all the other stuff that's <laughs> messed up. Okay, and now they're separate. Okay, so now look at this carefully with me. The first thing that we saw is a clue up here in red should be screaming at you, right? What is that equal to? This is one. Now just pause for a second, pause for a second. I want us to remember why it is one, okay? R you might remember doing the circle geometry thing with radian measure, that's one reason. The other reason, which is more about like, how these things are behaving. As h approaches zero, what's sine h approaching? Zero. zero. As h approaches zero, what's the denominator approaching? Zero. Also zero, right? But the critical thing is, they are both approaching zero at the same rate, at the same rate. That's why the ratio is gonna turn into a one to one, which is one. Okay, so I'm going to write that down in a second. That's good. Then I want you to look over here. Have a look at this other limit. Okay. What's happening here? Um, for instance, as h approaches zero, what's this doing? Where's it going? So can you separate it into like cos h? I can, but I'm deliberately not for a reason that will become clear in a second. What's happening to this? Now, cos h, we know what cos h looks like. It's going towards one. So therefore, it's going towards one take away one, which is zero. Right? So this is going to zero. What's happening to the denominator? Also going towards zero. So therefore, is it reasonable to conclude that since that is doing the same as this, is it also equal to one? No. The answer is it is not. But how do we show that? How do we reason through? Like, on the way that I've shown them, they both look like they're going to zero and zero, so why aren't they both equal to the same thing? Okay, I'm going to appeal to a picture now. Okay, now maybe you just want to draw this off on the side in um, a small way. <clears throat> okay, now first let's just get a picture for what this one looks like. Sine h over h, right? So here is the sine curve, right? And here is the x curve, yeah? So you can see they're both approaching zero, but they're approaching at the same rate, yes? Okay, now flex your trig graphing muscles a teeny bit. Not the cos h, but the whole numerator. What does that look like? It's like the cos graph moved It is the cos graph. Which way is it going? It's, yeah. down. it's shifted oh, downward. Yeah. Take away one. Okay. So therefore, rather than going from negative one to one, it's going from zero. negative two to zero. Yes? So it looks something like that. Do you agree with that? So there's cos h minus one. You can see it's approaching zero. And then you've got this guy. There's that graph. Now you have a look. They're both approaching zero, but it's qualitatively different from what's happening here. Do you see that? For instance, seeing as cos h minus one has a stationary point there at the origin, right? That means that over here, like compare, compare these values here with these values up here. Clearly the cos h minus one graph is really, really small, much faster than the h graph is. Do you see that? So even though they're both approaching zero, this guy is getting here drastically faster. It's always smaller. Does that make sense? So that's why these guys, both approaching zero at the same rate. So I'm going to write this down as one. All right, that's what I'm getting out of this limit here. Okay. But this time, they're both approaching zero, but the top guy, he's like, <laughs> he leaves the denominator in the dust. He gets the zero so much faster that this turns into zero. Does that make sense? You see how I reasoned that visually? So this means I've got the sine x out the front that was in independent of the limit. And then you've got the cos x out here, also independent of the limit. So what's left? Cos. It's just cos. Ta-da! Now that was not too difficult because we had a lot of the pieces already prepared. We already knew this. Therefore, we, could, we were equipped to deal with this. And we also had the trig expansions to blow everything out in the first place. Okay. So, this time, now we're done with the algebra, draw me a picture, draw me a nice decent sized one of sine x. That's what we just differentiated, right? <laughs> Always 
bigger than you think. <laughs> okay. Um, mine's a bit lopsided, but you get the idea. Okay. Now have a look at my side X curve, right? In a new color, maybe I'll do it in green. In a new color, and I'm going to dot it just to make it really clear. I'm going to draw the cos curve on top of it. What this is telling me is that this is the gradient function of this. Let's see what that means. Now the extension one, extension two students, I began with this before because it's a quick, um, somewhat <laughs> um, um, intuitive argument. Wasn't a proof at all. This was a proof. But you have a look now, right? Think about some critical points. For instance, I can see on the sine curve, the most important features with regard to calculus are probably the two stationary points, right? Now when you have a stationary point on a curve, on the black curve, what does that mean about your derivative? For a stationary point? Answer zero, right? Which is exactly what you see. At x is equal to pi on two, right? You've got the sine x curve having its first stationary point, and you've got cos x, cos pi on 2, of course, is 0. And the second stationary point over here, 3 pi on 2, again, you've got that marrying up. What else do you see that you can conclude? For instance, remember how we said, oh, look, the gradient of x and the gradient of sine x, they're both approaching the same thing as they go towards the origin. Do you see that? What is the actual value of the gradient? It's 1, because that, that green line is my gradient function, right? So it's 1. No wonder, wonder, no wonder these things are approaching the same thing at the same rate, because the gradient, of course, of y equals x is 1, and the gradient of sine x at that point is also 1. So if I drew a tangent line here, it would, in fact, be y equals x, okay? Um, other things you can keep noticing, for example, on this part of the graph that I've shown, I've got increasing and increasing. In the middle here is where I'm decreasing, right? In fact, that's a point of inflection, is it not? How do you know I, I know it's a point of inflection? Because the gradient becomes concave up. Yeah, that's right. I've gone, um, this is concave down, and this becomes concave up, which corresponds to um, the derivative turning around like this, which I'm going to show once I get the derivative for cosine. Okay. And you can keep on getting insights out of it. The important thing is the picture and you can see how we got there.